Um, I'm presenting today on our departmental textbook. I have one copy here, but there's a picture of the cover up there. Uh, this project has been, it's been developed by members of our department, and we have already our pilot edition. Next year, our first edition will come out, and so I'm reflecting on that process. Um, I'll show you the title of my talk. I've used this notion of heteroglossia as a frame with which to reflect on the whole process of developing the textbook, which has been a very exciting and time-consuming, enormous time-consuming project. Um, and I'll just present to you, well, let me just talk a little bit about the cover. The cover um, is, I don't know if you can see what it is, or you can guess what it is. Do you know where it comes from? Uh, is it really? Does it remind you of anything? Roots? Roots, yes, roots. From a ward and observatory. And the photo was taken by one of our doctoral students, who did his PhD on graffiti and hip hop. He also wrote a case study for our textbook. And we chose this uh, after much debate because we felt it symbolizes what we wanted our textbook to do, which is to kind of break the bounds of what is normally considered communication and language and suitable for academic study. Um, and so to put it up there as another symbolic mode uh, and therefore also to, to say that this is what we, what we are about. Okay, so the co-editors are myself and Gift Mehta, who was a contract lecturer here and has now moved up to DUT, Durban University of Technology, and that's been a great loss. Um, but I, you know, he, he he, he and I are still in contact and co-editing uh, as we go along. Um, it's our set text for our first year course, but because it's grown, you can see it's quite fat, and we've, for the first edition we've got an extra three chapters plus a glossary, plus an index. The book's going to be even fatter. Um, we're actually realizing we can use it at more than the first year, because there's just too much material for first year. Some chapters we just dip into at first year, and so we're starting to use it also at second and third year. We even find that our tutors love it. They say to us, why didn't you do this for us? They use it in all their research, and mm -hmm. it's become a very useful tool, and I think it has a role, particularly for, say, masters, language education master's students who don't have a strong background in linguistics or haven't done an undergraduate language degree, may find it a useful way of catching up. Um, so our audience was originally our first year students, but I think it's expanded. I'm just briefly going to give you an overview of the textbook. Um, it has six parts, and they cover communication, what is much more traditionally linguistics, formal linguistics, phonetics, phonology, morphology, syntax. We have a section on language learning. <coughs> Parts four and five cover what is typically referred to as sociolinguistics. Four is more language diversity, um, processes of standardization, language contact, multilingualism. Part five are the new, very contemporary uh, fields in sociolinguistics around identity, branding, linguistic landscapes. And the finale, written by Professor Bassi, sitting there, one of our authors, we are all authors in our department, yes. is uh, on language study and the professions, in which we try to show the relevance of some of the material that's been introduced in the book to um, language professions. Okay, so why heteroglossia? Well, I don't want to go spend too long on Bakhtin because I don't have a very long time. But as you know, Bakhtin is the Russian literary philosopher writing at the, in the first half of the 1900s, um, translated into English only in 1986, but has been very influential. And um, I like this quote because he says, all understanding is actively responsive and constitutes nothing other than the initial preparatory stage of a response. And the speaker <coughs> himself is oriented precisely towards such an actively responsive understanding. He expects response, agreement, sympathy, objection, execution, and so forth. Moreover, every speaker is himself a respondent to a greater or lesser degree. He is not, after all, the first speaker, the one who disturbs the eternal silence of the universe. Any utterance is a link in a very complexly organized chain of other utterances. And I thought that that's what our textbook is. The, what you see here is a product, but actually the process was much more important, and how we are in this link of utterances 
was an interesting idea for me when reflecting on how our textbook is heteroglossic. So I sort of have a few points, and I'll just cover as many of them as I have time for. The first, in the first way in which it's heteroglossic is in terms of its conceptualization. We tried to write a linguistics from the South textbook. Uh, otherwise, our, all our examples, all our references, our, we try to cover all the Southern African Bantu languages. We've got lots of the Khoisan languages, and we try to reflect local research. Um, we have very, p these, are, these are all um, Bactinian words, right? Polyphonic authorship, which mm. I'll tell you about. Uh, we had to really try and work with the notion of addressivity, which is, was referred to a little bit in my previous quote, whereby when you write, you must have your audience in mind. And when you're writing a textbook, if you don't have a clear sense of your audience, um, it doesn't work. I won't go into much detail on that, but we did develop a whole kind of design or style for our textbook, based very much on this notion of um, knowledge as a co-construction that you cannot just transmit knowledge in a linear fashion. You have to engage your reader and get them to interact in some ways with the text. Okay, dialogic reverberations. We felt that, I felt that described the writing process. There were lots of reverb, I would call it almost universal reverberations. <laughs> and then responsive reactions was the use of feedback. And we, you, we've piloted it for the first half of this year. So we did an evaluation at the end of the first semester, and I've got feedback from the students. And um, we've also, it's been to reviewers and things like that. And then just a few comments on where to from here. So I won't cover all the points, because we only have about 15 minutes, but I'll just pick up on some of them. Okay, so when, what do we mean by linguistics from the South? Well, we started with this notion that multilingualism is the norm. Um, we tried through our way of writing about language and the examples we gave to celebrate our linguistic heritage, of which I mean, Southern Africa is so rich, uh, you don't need to go outside Southern Africa to find your examples. So for example, we have lots of uh, local examples and case studies. The case studies were primarily written by doctoral students. It was an opportunity for them to also have a voice in the textbook. We have, a, at the end of the day, we have 19 chapters some were written by doctoral students, often in collaboration with a more senior author, but um, some were written by doctoral students alone, but the case studies are generally written. So these are all doctoral students in our department. Um, I, I won't read through them, but you can see that they deal with local issues, with local research. Um, the students like the hip-hop graffiti writing case study that came up in our, in our evaluation. And so this was part of a whole process of first-year curriculum renewal within our department. Okay, we have many authors. We have 24 authors for the pilot edition, plus one for the final edition. Now, that's a lot of authors to manage and work with and keep in touch, and that was my job. Um, everybody are, is, are staff members, doctoral students, honorary or extraordinary professors or research fellows, associated with our department. So that has been a, a wonderful part of the process, is uh, how it's brought everyone together, together around a collective project. We represent, we're very pan-African, we even have people from Belgium, Sweden, and the one in Australia is in brackets, because she's actually South African, but she's living <laughs> in Australia, so I think she, she would probably more self-identify as South African. Um, we also, obviously, through the process, we had a process of internal review, <coughs> where the professors in our department read all the chapters and commented, and then an external review where it went to colleagues and friends and associates at other universities. All that input has, of course, been incorporated. Our tutors and students from 2012 and 2013. 2012, we were piloting it in just our own workbook form, extracts from some of the chapters which were ready. 2013 is a published book and of course the publishing team. So in terms of authorship, that is why we call it polyphonic, and we can say it is a truly collective effort. Um, it also raised some challenges. We had multiple authors, both experienced and inexperienced, and local and overseas. And so we tried to work by putting people into teams. Um, we saw it very much as a developmental exercise, whereby younger, Many of the 
doctoral students had, had not yet published. In fact, they were just writing their doctorates. So this was the first experience of writing something for publication. And we worked in teams often with more experienced authors working with the less experienced authors. Um, I think this was very successful, um, although not always. Um, we, I'll talk about some of the problems we had in a minute. What, the major problem, I think, particularly for the inexperienced writers, was switching register. Mm -hmm. So they, well, they just used to write in their theses. The, mm -hmm. And they could not write mm -hmm. with the right voice for a, And you could see that with the more experienced writers, they could immediately switch register, they could switch level. But this was very hard for the, the younger people. We tried to get consistency through having a typical um, chapter structure and style, aims, key concepts, intro, summary, further reading, study questions, a case study if appropriate. Not every chapter has a case study, although about half do. But we obviously had co-authorship issues because we had issues where one person would begin a chapter and it just wasn't good enough. So you would bring in a second author, a more experienced author, who would basically completely overwrite their first chapter. And then the question becomes, who's the author and whose name is first? And mostly these were resolved very amicably, but we did have a few problems. So we had to develop a co-authorship policy. And we had to, and this was also a very good experience for the department, to really look at these issues of how you work with other people's writing, who is an author, you know, if you just contribute examples to a text, does that qualify you to be an author? Um, and so we had to try and work with these questions. Uh, in which order should names be listed? What happens in cases where an author's work has been completely cut out or overwritten by other authors? And you know that often happens in the development of a chapter because a chapter is a process. So somebody would start, and they would work it up, and then other people would be brought in, and the other person for some reason wouldn't be around, and then that chapter would get reworked because somebody has a different vision for that chapter. And so it is complicated. It's a lot more complicated than one imagines. And what is the role of the editor? Um, and consulting editors, we had consulting editors as well. And at what point does the editor become an author? Sometimes I felt like I was the author of all the chapters. <laughs> but, no, not all. But, you know, you, 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 it's, at the end of the day, I think you have to accept that it's a collective effort and not everybody's name is, on, is reflected in everything that they did, but everybody's name is there in some position, in some role, in some place. Okay, so addressivity, I'm going to skip through this because um, what I thought was, I mean, the, we've been hearing about this the whole of today, um, so these were some of the things we tried, uh, you know, use your teaching voice, I thought what I'd just do, oh, I wanted to talk about concepts because Bassi raised that, this is a real problem in our discipline clarity of concepts, and it's the one thing that came up through the evaluation, is the students asked for, they want more clarity of concepts, and I was quite surprised, because I think our textbook has, we've tried as hard as possible, Bassi did a little handout for us on how you define concepts, so we, we were all working with a certain notion, I think sometimes the writers themselves were not clear about concepts, and then as an editor I would try to help them work that through, but the students asked for that over and over again. So for the first edition, we will have a glossary. Um, okay, what I'll quickly just do now is switch over and show you what one of the chapters looks like. Just so you can see. I suppose that's big enough. Is it? And you can see we have aims and... Um, I'm not sure how to run this down. Here we are, okay. Uh, aims and key concepts, and an intro, and then, can I put it down? Anyway, yeah. here we are. And then what we, we use these text boxes a lot, so key definitions or extra information, we tried to break up the text as much as possible, we tried to use visuals, okay, here she's, she's used this text box just to put in a bit of extra info, the students love the grey text boxes. They told us they liked those very much. They also liked the fact that we bolded all the concepts. 
you know, when you butt to depend no, on it, it's fine. I'm going to I'm just, I'll just go back to my. No, I'm just going to go back. You can find my thing if you want. Can I go back? Um, and I mean, I, I also think that they don't read, and this will come up through the evaluation, that when we did the evaluation, a lot of them said they were reluctant to read, and so they would use those grey text boxes and the bolded, highlighted core terms to quickly find the definitions they needed. But anyways, these are all things that we have to reflect on. Okay, dialogic reverberations. An utterance is a link in the chain of speech communication, and it cannot be broken off from the preceding links that determine it, both from within and from without, giving rise within it to unmediated responsive reactions and dialogic reverberations. And um, I, I, that I'm using this as a sort of a, a frame to think about the writing process and how when you write you are simply part of those dialogic reverberations. You are yet just another link in the whole chain of links. And once again, I won't go through this, but this is briefly a timeline of the writing process. We first submitted a proposal to Van Skyke in November 2010. You'll see the first drafts were more or less in. I'm always saying more or less, because there were a few latecomers there. The second draft, more or less in there. Um, beginning of 2013, this year pilot edition published, and the First edition, the revisions I can thankfully say are in, I was about to say more or less, but they are in, and publication by the end of this year or next. Would you also notice that I've highlighted in green are all the workshops, and this was a very important part of our process. It was seen as a developmental process, so we, in order to especially bring on board all those new writers and to get them inducted into all sorts of aspects of writing, we had. Um, I was just counting up, I mean, it's six. Mm -hmm. And that, that's not counting all the individual feedback, the times I've sent with them and gave them feedback. Um, right. So my editorial role was ongoing work with the authors, um, often one by one, multiple drafts and checking, considerable editing at times, overwriting, management of the process. Uh, I wanted to mention that we all <coughs> agreed that the royalties um, we, we, the royalties are paid to the university, 30% go to the various units within the university, but 70%, which is the author's share, is paid to our department. So nobody stands to gain personally, uh, and it will be for research and development. Okay, so responsive reactions, all right? This is our user feedback, and I'll just take the last four minutes to talk about that. Um, we were very happy at the beginning of the year when we got this email. So a student had set up a meeting with her lecturer, one of the young lecturers on the course, Fiona Ferris, and she didn't come to the meeting, <laughs> and later Fiona gets this message. Okay, sorry about the grammar. I apologize for sending this email this time of the morning. I bought the LCS book yesterday, and I've been trying to study the book, getting more information on the work we did in the lecture. I now have no reason for coming to see you because I finally fully understand what is going on. What I'm trying to say is that I would like to cancel my appointment because I am settled now. This book has been useful. Now I'm on track. Yeah, we thought we would frame that. <laughs> Except for the, the grammar mistakes. We thought we should maybe clean it up before we frame it. But uh, <laughs> you think it must be. <laughs> okay. Um, right, we had a, we sold out our first print run, over 750 copies sold, so that means that about 75% of our students own the textbook, because we have about 1,000 students. Um, when, when we asked in the evaluation, why didn't you buy the book, many of them said they didn't have money, they mentioned the fact that NIS NISFAS had been paid late, the student funding is, is a great problem, I think. Um, the majority said they found the textbook useful and interesting. You know, your first evaluation question is normal, normally, did you find the textbook useful and interesting? And they all say yes. But they did give some good uh, answers. It made one look at familiar concepts with a new perspective. We enjoyed it, and I think that's often the thing where you deal with things like language and communication, which everybody uses every day, but they haven't thought about it in a critical or uh, more abstracted way. 
enjoyed learning about the different ways of communicating that I never really thought about. And I, I very much like this last comment. I feel this is getting towards where we want to, what we wanted to achieve. The course has taught me about the importance of my culture, language, and my identity as an individual to make my own choices and believe in myself. And I, I felt proud about that because I thought, well, because all our content is local, people could see that. And then they were also so happy to see that their lecturers had written the textbook. Mm -hmm. And it is an affirmation of, of what we have here. You know, we're not having to look elsewhere for our material. Those were the all-time favorite topics. And somebody mentioned that this morning about students needing to be able to relate <coughs> to the material. So that, you know, when it's about identity or branding or graffiti or hip hop, then it's very, uh, very easy to get them to engage. There are difficulties with chapters with many new concepts, all which were historical in nature. I think, once again, that's just, you, know, you have to engage with those in a much more um, mental way, I suppose. They said it was easy to read, they liked the great text boxes, but clearer definitions, explanations, and the key concepts and examples still needed. And I was really surprised because we have so many examples. Everything is explained over and over again. But obviously, this, as Bassi was pointing out, this is something that we have to think about. Um, oh, the, some said the textbook should be short, not all, but some said the textbook should be shortened and simplified. Summarize the textbook, put it in plain, simple yes. English. I, I don't know how it would be in plain or simple. Because I, I really do think we achieved a very, in, many ch in most chapters, a very accessible level, but <laughs> I think, I think, the, yeah, and then that, the one at the bottom is the fun. It doesn't always. Make the textbook smaller, it does not always fit in my bag. <laughs> um, but you know, we, it, it did cause us to think, why are people, um, why is there this resistance to reading? And is it just to reading, or is it difficulties with reading academic English? And I actually asked my students, because I had my own group, so what did you like about the textbook, or what didn't you? And one guy said, no, he didn't like anything about the textbook. So I said, no, but you can't say that. There must have been one chapter you liked about the textbook. And then he said, no, actually, the problem isn't the textbook, it's with reading. He doesn't like to read. And I realized, actually, that probably in our courses, we have to start take a step even further back and start with why you need to read. And then when you talk to students, you find, oh, actually, I like reading the newspaper, or I read this. So they do read, but maybe that is something we need to really encourage. So where to from here? Um, I think that now we have our textbook. Um, we need to start thinking very in a very focused way about our tutorial program, which we put a lot of effort into and we train our tutors and we prepare extensive materials, but I think we have to look much more at the academic literacy issues, probably cut down some of the conceptual stuff that we do in tutorials and focus more on reading. Um, so I don't think I'm ready yet for another project, but a companion student workbook could be a next step and you know, possibly using some of these wonderful e-teaching tools and getting students. It seems to me that Perhaps if, if that is a way that students will engage, online tools, you know, if you could have the right people working on that and get uh, some sort of interactive exercises going. A uh, suggestion from one of the colleagues was to translate the glossary into uh, Corsa and Afrikaans. Website for user feedback. So these are all some of the ideas that have come up. Okay, so to conclude, major challenges and rewards. Well, um, our major problem was deadlines. People are very busy and people are under a lot of pressure. So that was a problem. People would then not respond to me when I wrote to ask, where is your chapter? Um, jointly authored chapters were a problem in the sense that, especially if one person was more senior, then the other authors would not feel they could comment on or, or work on that bit written by the more senior, especially because they say they're supervisor. And ultimately, at the end of the day, the first author has to take ownership of the chapter mm -hmm. and overwrite and cut out and be ruthless. And often that first author was a younger person because it was their, their opportunity. And so I had to be quite, um, I had to get involved sometimes in helping shape those chapters. Um, and the loss of my co-editor was also <laughs> a major 
challenge. But I think there have been the most enormous gains, uh, certainly the most exciting project I have been involved in at UWC, and we, our whole department, is very proud. And I think perhaps for us, what makes us most happy is that it has had a profound impact on the quality of teaching and learning at first year. Um, because now you feel you've just got a quality text. We have a high turnover of staff, high turnover of lecturers, high turnover of tutors, but at least the textbook is there to provide a baseline. Oh, and there we are, our consulting editors, reviewers. Uh, Raj Mestri from UCT wrote the forward for our first edition. And, um, okay, so thank you to all. Thank you very much. Yes. Publishers will put out an ebook, but I think they have the same price as for the, the hard, the hard. I mean, the paper copy. Um, the graffiti. Uh, yes, I asked Quentin. Quentin took the photo. Um, he gave permission for us to use the photo, but I did ask him, and apparently, graffiti is public, publicly viewable. It's, there is a there is a tag. That's the the guy's name. He's K. Looks like K E double five. Anyway. So his signature is there, but nobody knows his identity unless you're inside that community of graffiti artists. Mm. So generally, you don't apparently, you, know, you don't approach them for permission because they are they're anonymous. Yeah. But you see, what Quentin said to me is, as long as the tag is visible, mm. and in the textbook we do discuss this picture, and we, so the the picture is slightly off center. Initially, the publishers put it center, and they cut the tag, and we asked ask them to move it to ensure that his identity is shown. But apparently if you are a graffiti artist, you will know who it is by the style, because they all have their own styles. Yes. Mm. <laughs> Such a wonderful project. You said mm. something about the process affecting your teach, the quality of your teaching and money. I just want to understand, was it the process, itself, was it the goal before the development, or was it during the process of writing the book? You know, it, um, I, it wasn't really planned. It was actually the, the way it started was a publisher sent me a proposal for a first year linguistics, or for an introductory linguistics textbook, and she asked me to review the proposal. And I looked at it, and it, I just thought it was very boring. And I wrote back and I said, this is far too boring. We do much more exciting stuff with our students. We wouldn't prescribe it. And then she wrote back and she said, well, put in a proposal. But then they, you see, they also know that, well, they, by then they knew that we had um, over a thousand students, and so we're a market in ourselves. So they obviously encouraged us. We wouldn't have probably done this without the publisher mm. asking. Mm. And then the publisher asked, and we had a workshop, and we brainstormed topics, and we wrote them up, and we volunteered. Right, who wants to write this? Oh, I'll write this. I'll write. So everyone just volunteered, and it was all very kind of NGO style, and you know, so it wasn't actually planned, and it was, I think it was okay, it worked out, but it was a lot of work, that's what that was all. Mm -hmm. So the, the other stuff became evident, it sort of became obvious how it was a process of growth as we went along, because people grew into it, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, sorry, just, just really comment to add one quick question, because I'm, I'm, I'm so inspired by the project, because sort of in the 90s, it reminds me of the projects we were doing in psychology yeah. um, to transform the discipline to mm -hmm. bring in more local experiences yeah. and images and and that was involved in a few of those edited they were kind of edited texts because we couldn't get acknowledgement for them unless but they were textbooks actually and i think it was such a valuable process but one of the things that we did for ground was co was was the development of authorship and i think that's what you've done here and i think 
you should think about also, you know, writing that up and, yeah. and because it's a model of developing authorship and I think it's a very important model and, you know, so even though maybe that wasn't your initial intention, that's what it became. It became an authorship development project. Mm -hmm. And then just a, just a quick comment, um, for, for us, one of the important things for students was actually seeing, because you said all of your staff and postgraduate students are authors mm -hmm. on there. What sort of impact has that had on the students? Because I mean, I think that's also really important for students to see. Yes, you know, people teaching them are involved mm. in, in this authorship, and, and it's, it's somehow in one book. It's, it's mm. a really. Uh, I mean, was there any well, response? Well, it just to came that? through in some of the evaluations because we, we interviewed our own tutorial groups. We had a discussion, and then the tutors reported to us, and we had a discussion. Um, and then we got them to write on the evaluations. Do you know how quick people do? So it's just a few comments here and there. And, and yes, there were at least three or four comments saying it was so nice to see our, our lecturers were the authors. Mm -hmm. So I suppose it's a feeling of pride or ownership or mm -hmm. affirmation. And to see students publishing also then shifts that sort of gap between yes. students and academics. Which I think 